Hello, Gaston County. Welcome to episode number 72 of Gaston's Great, a podcast highlighting some of the great things happening in and around Gaston County. I'm your host, Stephen Long, and we are coming to you once again from the worldwide headquarters of GSN Services, and we continue to look forward to having some great discussions, discussions in the coming weeks and months. We simply believe in discussing more of the reasons why Gaston's great. We have another great uh, organization this week as we highlight the Hoyle Historic Homestead. We have Robert Carpenter and Dr. Alan May with us today. Robert is a current board member, and uh, Dr. May is the chair of the board. Robert and Alan, it's great to have you on, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Yes, it is. All right, so we're going to get right to it as usual. Um, Robert, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into talking about the the homestead. Anything you'd like to share? Well, I'm a native of Gaston County, uh, former principal of in the county, retired now happily, <laughs> but it was certainly a, a great service to be principal at the many schools that I was uh, principal at. Um, I've always had an interest in history. Okay, uh, I teach genealogy and local history at Gaston College, um, and I, I teach an advanced class and a beginning class. That's interesting. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and, and so we, we have a great time. Have a lot of folks who who fail consistently, so that they can take it over again, <laughs> uh, and we can get together and talk and learn together. And uh, uh, and so I became involved with the Hoyle Historic Homestead originally with the original purchase of of the of the house by the Gutierrez family, and uh, uh, and have been involved since. Okay, I've uh, intensively been involved in writing, trying to compose the history of the whole historic homestead. And uh, it takes too much time. <laughs> well, very good. I appreciate you sharing that. So, Alan, what about you? What can you, would you like to share about yourself, sir? I'm the um, archaeologist for the Shield Museum of Natural History. Right. And I'm a lecturer at UNC Charlotte in the anthropology department. And that helped me get hooked up with the uh, Hoyle Historic Homestead initially with a survey and planning grant from the state of North Carolina in the late 90s to do some archaeological survey in and around the house itself so that uh, there could be a preservation plan put together with okay. that. So back in 1998, uh, a couple of students from UNCC came over and we started a shovel testing prospect and then from that point on several more uh, survey and planning grants and some other funding came available to do some actual testing um, outside of the house in and around one of the outbuildings and also uh, there was a pretty good sized pole barn Hmm. that was um, toward the east from the house that collapsed sometime in the late 70s and then uh, with a little cleanup, we determined that there was some interesting brickwork that had been obscured after mm. the uh, after the barn collapsed, and with the suggestion that there was possibly another building that was located on that site. And archives and history came in; they scratched their head and said, "Yeah, I think that's right because that kind of uh, brick work is not usually associated with an outbuilding; it's usually associated with." A residence or a gotcha. structure okay. and that's how we got started and we actually also took up the flooring in the core of the house because there was some question about the fireplace there's in the, within the house and the creation of a partition wall between one of the main rooms it's a variation of something called hall and parlor construction and it had been divided up and then we again decided we needed to see what was going on the floor was starting to rot we had some uh, termite damage Mm. and and part of the house and so in the course of taking that up we determined that the fireplace had in fact been modified probably after the turn of the 19th century and uh, Robert is my my go-to person as far as the more of the historical aspects about that I'm just the uh, questioning uh, <laughs> inquisitor on that very good and um, and determined that uh, we could do some archaeology in there so there's collections from within and around the house and um, also uh, a current project 
is to uh, add um, restroom facilities in the form of a recreation of one of the structures that was identified in a, um, in a um, homecoming back in the 1930s. And so we're going to try to get that there so that we okay. can enhance um, some of the educational activities that we'd like the community to know more about uh, the importance. Well, good. So that that segues perfectly into kind of the whole the whole point here, right? Is is uh, because of my personal involvement with the the, the community and and knowing uh, Dr. May and and some involvement with the Shoah Museum. I'm personally a little familiar with with the the homestead, but so let's just kind of go back. Um, and, and this is a question is for both of you or who uh, whoever would be we'd be best to answer. Tell us about what is it. Why is it significant? And, you know, why are we, why are the work you're doing to just kind of, because I'm sure we're going to have some listeners who are like, what? Uh, you know, what, 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 most people, I'm going to assume most longtime residents have heard of, of, of it here, but they might not know exactly the significance and why it is such an important, um, you know, piece here, uh, here in Gaston County. Does that, does that question make any sense at all? <laughs> yeah, it does. Okay. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense because we're try, still trying to figure it out, too. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, there's a couple things about the house. It's been written up as the oldest house in Gaston County. Okay. Still standing. And it may very well be. But we're still not sure because when they built it, they did not write down anywhere when they built it, the date or any time. And so we've had to, to, to use ar- uh, archaeology, architecture, and written history to try to document how old right. it is, where it came from. Uh, the house is architecturally unique because it's corner post log constructed house. The only house still surviving of that architecture south of Pennsylvania, you know, Maryland, Maryland, I think. Okay, that's uh, correct. And and so no, I didn't know that. That's what, okay. it, well, that's really unique. And and when when the folks first came out there, they just t- did double back over flips because they could not believe that <laughs> you know the house. So you're saying, well, what is this and why is it unique? Well, you think of a log house as being chinked at the at the ends, you yep. know, and put together. This was not like that. They put up four posts, the four corners of the house, and then inlaid between those four corners with logs. And they use supporting uh, posts or supporting, what do you, what's the word? They uh, do uh, corner bracing. Brace. Okay. And the, uh, the, the logs themselves were mortise and tenoned into the uprights. They, they weren't just using a kind of lay it on the top sort of thing. Oh. Okay. No, and so, and so it was inlaid, and so you have these huge walls, and you have this... Uh, and when we originally looked at it, of course, and uh, it's been having been there for over two hundred years, it's it's been changed a lot. But the inside was originally whitewashed log, was whitewashed. Then it's been covered over with uh, paneling boards, um, and the outside. We're not sure if the outside was originally log or not, but we think it probably was. And then it was uh, weatherboarded over later on with. We know that there was a major renovation uh, probably around the 1820s or 30s <laughs> uh, to create a center hall construction. And so you, we don't know if the original – there's so many questions still. Sure. We don't know if the original inside of the house was one big room or three big rooms like it currently is. It's four rooms now. But that's part of that is the center hall construction part right. of it. And so uh, as Dr. May indicated – one of the issues was the, the fireplace, the chimney, uh, and it was on the east side. And uh, we discovered, he discovered through his archaeological work, and, of course, we've learned from it, that that they converted that into two chimneys and created a room with a partition that goes down to the middle almost into the, the chimney, okay. original chimney. A very unusual, very unusual. Um very early house. Um, it was very nicely done. Uh, a lot of the, the de- it's decorative, um, and and you know you can see the changes over the years. And back part of the house, we chose sometime along the line, and I think you were involved in that process with with uh, Mr. Ryan. Uh, we chose to restore the house as it currently exists 
okay. back to around 1900 or so with the idea that all the changes tell a story. Number one. Number two, we really didn't know what it looked like originally. <laughs> we didn't know if we'd have to tear off those. That's a, that's a real good point, Robert. The, um, the idea is, is that the, the architecture of the house itself is a reflection of, of changing thoughts and patterns about uh, the use of space. And it's a, it's a, a museum in itself right. of what people were looking at and thinking, okay, I'm going to expand this part of the house or I'm going to add another story or I'm going to enclose and bring the kitchen a little bit closer because originally the kitchen would have been a separate building because of the concern for fire. And uh, so all of these things you can see in the subsequent uh, modifications and construction of the house. And so the idea, and some people have suggested this, that we take it back mm -hmm. to what it looked like when the first Hoyle that actually built and lived in the house um, would, would Do, be familiar with it, but uh, that, would have, that would take away from all the other good stuff that yeah. happened from that time forward. Do, do you know, do we have a feel for when, when exactly that was? When you say it's the oldest house south of Maryland with that type of construction, do we, do we have a... F it, many, uh, many folks wrote up, and, and of course I was a person who read that stuff and believed it because I always believe everything that's written, right? <laughs> just like on you the know, internet. <laughs> yeah, you know, just like everything. If it's copyrighted, it has to be correct, right? So, so the, the idea and, and what was written was that this house was built by pioneer Peter Hoyle, who arrived in America in 1732. Okay. Now, and then moved down here in seven, the early 1750s, 1752-ish or so, uh, and he would have built that house. Well, every architectural historian and every person from archives and history walked in and said he did not build his house. It's too big. It's too nice. There's no way. He did not have the technology at that point in time, you know. Not that he couldn't have done it uh, at some point, but at that point in time, just moving down here, that was not something that occurred, which caused us pause. So then we, we, our research has taken us to, okay, who built the house and when was it built? The house is built on the land that was granted to a man by the name of John Hoyle, who was Peter's son. Okay. And John Hoyle received that land grant in 1764. Now, 1764, that's a long way, you know. Now, we don't know if John built that house or not, but it's possible that he built that house. It was, a, it was again, it's a very sophisticated structure to be built in colonial America at that point in time when everybody else yeah, was just building. We're still talking pre-revolutionary. Oh, yeah, pre-revolutionary. <laughs> and so, so long story short is we believe – or at least I believe at this point with the documentation we have, that either John Hoyle built it sometime after his acquiring that land, right. number one, or number two, when he sold that property to his son Andrew uh, in 1794, okay. that Andrew then, he, he already had a wife or was getting married or whatever and, this, and built this huge house for her because she came from a very prominent family, the Wilfong family, from what's now Catawba and Lincoln County. And so he would have wanted to impress. Gotcha. And so, uh, and so we believe that those are the two dates we're dealing with. Now, who built it? We, again, we don't know. It's one of those two people. You know, the other question has to do with, with the Peter Hall thing is sort of, you know, how these things be, become, they, they take on a, a life of their own. Mythological, maybe? That's right. <laughs> and so, and so you know, that's one of the issues. And we still have people to say, well, I'll never believe that Peter Hall didn't build that house. I said, well, you can believe what you want to believe, <laughs> you know, because there's a lot of things on the Internet. But that's, that's what we call that confirmation bias these that's days. That's right. right. <laughs> that's right. But the house sits on the land of John Hall. Okay. So the land does not sit on the, the house does not sit on the land of Peter. So, so for our listeners that might not know, so where exactly is, is the house? It's, uh, it's between Dallas and Stanley mm -hmm. on Highway 275, the Dallas-Stanley Highway. It's before you get to the South Fork River yep. on your right. Yep. So if you, if you ever, you know, maybe next, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, Sure, a lot of people, most, most, anybody driving, obviously, Dallas and Stanley has seen it, yeah. but they may not realize exactly, you know, without really paying attention. I know, you know, half the time when I'm driving around, I'm not paying attention to anything. But. 
Uh, being there a, being is a, a sign. Though. Yeah, there is. And being a lifelong Gaston County resident and, and having family, my mother's family was from Stanley and Lucia area. So uh, I have drove, driven that road hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. So, you know, I'm personally am familiar with that. Um, Alan, anything you'd like to add to, to that about the, the, the specific history of it, the time frame or anything? I looked at a lot of the same documents that Robert has been talking about and with a, with a skeptical eye and with the help from archives and history, I'm pretty much, uh, no, I'm completely in agreement with the location being on John's property okay. and I'm, I'm inclined to lean toward the uh, construction during Andrew's tenure and time, but we can't say any further oh, than, sure. than yeah. what he's already said. The, um, the idea that uh, Peter Hoyle built the house has been completely resolved to my satisfaction and for, for a variety of uh, related historical documents, and Robert's gone through those, and I've gone back through them as well. And there's always somebody that's going to come up and say, no, it didn't go that way. Yeah. And then we can go back and say, well, we did this, we looked at that, and then we've got confirmation from specialists in archives and history who've looked at the same documents and have said that, you know, based on our understanding of the readings of these documents and in the, the things that were going on legally at that time, that this is, this is pretty solid. Well, it's interesting you say stuff like that. Even here at GSM, you know, there was a almost folklorish story about that we told for many years about starting a GSM, you know, and guess what? We found out that wasn't exactly the way it happened back in the twenties, you know? And so, um, and even, even the 1927, if you look hard enough, you might could question that. So my point, yeah, that, that's a folklore, mythological, uh, confirmation bias stories. People hear something, Oh, yeah, if it relates to them, that's uh, that, but that's interesting to hear that. So, um, how much, um, how much land is there, you know, on that property, or is that a specifically is? When do you want us to go? Right now, it's about ten acres. Okay, good. That's and, what I, uh, yeah, I was talking about right now. Yeah, yeah, ten acres. Uh, there were a couple of grants that Robert can address specifically that uh, Peter Hoyle uh, petitioned for in the seventeen fifties that uh, he didn't he didn't receive one of them because it was more than the state wanted to grant, is my understanding. And uh, Robert's nodding in agreement, so I'm, I'm on pretty good footing with that. But he did have two other grants that uh, turned out to be about 800 acres, but neither one of them were associated with where the house is right now. And that's right. for John. Okay. So... Um so I'm assuming you, you know, the organization, the it, it's it's um, the historic whole historic homestead. Um, and so that that's the that's the organization that owns the property. Or, Correct. Okay. Yes. So what is you know what what is going on out there now? I mean, what does the future look like? I mean, some of these questions that we know we talked about this a little bit beforehand. Some of these normal questions that I ask maybe not apply to you know to to this particular. Um, site and what you guys are doing but kind of talk about what what is going on over the last few years what's the future i mean what's going on you know what's the what's the, the life the day in the life of um, a board member in the in the homestead you know does that make sense there yeah um bring him up to date i, sure. I would like to do that uh with with a reference to the mission Sure. Thank the, you. Yeah. For the for the homestead. I did. I did skip that question. Thank you, yeah. uh, Doctor. And that is to restore, preserve, and maintain the the house itself for educational purposes. The other thing that uh, in my discipline within archaeological anthropology is an increasing awareness that there is a quiet or an, a non voice in the community associated with farming, farmsteads. Okay. plantations and that has to do with the african-american component and robert has spent a lot of time working up uh, information about those african-americans that may have been associated with the homestead now in the, about the 1830s late 1830s um andrew hoyle was um requested to put together or be a part of a corporation that started the high shoals Ironworks. Okay. And in the um, in the records that are extant, it suggests that there were slaves that each of the principals were to, to uh, commit 
to work in uh, the ironworks, and uh, that was based on North Carolina legislation that said you could have a lot of land if you could produce so many hundred weight of iron after a certain period of time. And so um, a man named Fullen Wider was involved with that. Um, his, his offspring were involved with that. And coming from Germany, they recognized the, uh, the presence of iron ores in the area and said, okay. hey, we know how to do that. And so that's, that's where we're working. It's education. Gotcha. And uh, it's a reminder to the community um, on the second Saturday of every September that we have an open house. And we invite everyone to come and hear a little bit more about the history of the, the architecture of the house. But more importantly now, the changing emphasis is on those voiceless members of the community that were very much a part of the construction of this community both the landowners and the people that work the land. That's interesting. Um, you know, I think, is it fair to say that properties like that uh, either weren't, how many How many were properties like that that we just don't know about that were destroyed or that were, you know, something, don't have a group like you in, with, with the knowledge and the passion, so to speak, to keep it up. We had um, several episodes ago, we had the Baltimore Village School on, which is, uh, I had no I had no idea about that even existed and, and so i'm hoping maybe that people who don't aren't familiar with the the hoyle homestead will get something out of this episode maybe somebody will get interested maybe you know into your edu- education uh, education discussion there so again i appreciate you sharing the mission uh, about that and what you're trying to accomplish so um what do, what have you seen to your point uh dr may about the, the impact that you know this property has made and uh, on the education side specifically, I mean, I know there's been a lot of things going out there uh, on things going on out there for a long time now. Um, what are some? I mean, what are you most proud of accomplishing? What are some of the successes or impacts you've seen, whether it's with students or uh, finding something out, getting to the truth, maybe? Right, is something that you probably kind of already mentioned. Yeah. Something, something you can share uh, along those lines. Absolutely, the um, some of the recovered artifacts reflect the uh, the African American connection. Okay. And uh, uh, kind of uh, fragments of ceramic that are called Kelowna ware. And for a long time, we thought they were made by Catawbas because the Catawbas make similar kinds of unglazed ceramics. And then the historic ceramics that are coming out of there are an indication of the changing and increasing uh, wealth and and of the of the family that was there, and that's recognized by the the kinds of ceramics that came out of the, again, the excavations. But uh, pointing out the African-American component is, is an important thing that we do and, and reminding people that uh, these guys were hardworking and they were <laughs> really busy. In fact, busy staying you know, ahead of the game, if you will, and weren't, uh, weren't keeping too good a notes of what's <laughs> going on. So yeah. it's, it's an indirect story, but one that's a very interesting one both from the standpoint of what was going on around the homestead and that uh, it was the first post office that really? was in, yeah. Was now Gaston County. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Hoyle was really uh, uh, quite an accomplished person. Uh, he started out with basically that land. Um, he didn't have a huge inheritance. Um and by the way, that land at that point was around 700 acres. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's a chunk. Uh, <laughs> that gives you a perspective you know, there. But, you know, when you're rural, when you grew up in a rural area, you could also be considered land poor. Have too much land that you can't farm and you can't make money off of it, you know, and you end up paying taxes. But uh, to go back to, to the issue is Andrew was able to accumulate uh, a lot of resources, financial and uh, other resources, uh, personal resources, uh, through the hard work of himself, uh, the enslaved people there, and others that he hired to work for him. Uh, unfortunately, most of his papers have not survived. Hmm. So we're having to glean it from other places. Fortunately, also, uh, some of the papers having to do with his death uh, and his estate did survive over in Mecklenburg County, and we've been able to find some of these in local hands, in, in private hands, if okay. you will, 
And so we've been able to go through that and learn a lot from that. So, so Andrew was able to construct a store outside of the whole house, which no longer stands, but it's, it, we know it's, fair, it's, it's approximate location. Uh, and in, then that, within that store became the post office that uh, Alan just discussed. And, but, you know, also in front of that house, meaning in front of on the south side where the front porch really is, the front porch does not look towards the road. Right. The front yep. porch looks away from the road, was a major highway, not Interstate 85, <laughs> but it was uh, the Tuckasegee Road that ran from Charlotte, Tuckasegee Ford, which is over yep. in Mount Holly, all the way across the county to what's, what was then Trine Courthouse. Yep. And over on into uh, Cleveland County and into Rutherford wow. County, okay. uh, and so that road, if you think of it from a financial economic basis, was a driver of, of people buying, selling, people coming through, passing through, stopping by the store, you know, etc. Hmm. And so we have one ledger which has survived from his store. The ledger that survived was actually from the store that he had in Dallas. Because when Dallas was created as, as the county seat, yep. they moved that store, the, the, the operation of that store, to a new location in Dallas. And so then that, that ledger we do have and we're able to document some of the things that were sold at that store. And this was, this was while Andrew was still alive. And so you have a multitude of things that occurred there, and you have, you have a, and you, you know, if you can close your eyes and just think about all the people that were coming through, passing through, making money, losing money, trading, uh, a lot of activity going on at that house uh, and in that area. Are there still any do you, any Hoyle family ancestors here living in the in the county? Yes. Yes, there are uh, many, many descendants. And okay. in fact, when I first came onto the board, a lot of the board members were direct descendants, uh, not necessarily of Peter, but Peter's related related uh, kinsmen. Yeah. And in fact, um, there was a there is a huge book, <laughs> a huge genealogy that was done by a woman named Elizabeth Hoyle Rucker. Okay. And um, her dad was a, a minister over in what's now uh, Cleveland County, and uh, she did a lot of work, and um, it's, it's worth looking at if for no other reason it's a place to start if you're interested in the genealogy. The, the big problem that Robert and I both recognize is that there were no, it wasn't footnoted and it wasn't referenced, hmm. so we okay. don't have any way to really, you know, question further some of the links that uh, she attributed to the book. I am a Hoyle descendant, uh, which, which was part one motivator. Okay. But it was just my love of history and the fact that this was such a unique house, an old house that needed preserving, you know. And Absolutely. so, and so, you know, I was one of the few people on the early board that was a Hoyle. Yep. <laughs> you know, that here, last here. name was a Hoyle, <laughs> you know. And so, but since that time, it's been become more of a, of a regional, local uh, activity and supported regionally and locally by lots of different folks. And, that, and that's created the interest sure. that um, uh, Robert's work and some of the archaeology has generated interest in other people within the community to want to come on the board. And I would be perfectly happy to anybody in earshot of this to send me a note or through our website to get on the board and help out because there's something always really interesting yes. going gotcha. on. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's part of the historic process that uh, there's always going to be multiple hypotheses, if you want to think about it that way. <laughs> right. And uh, there are a number of ways, as Robert has pointed out, that we can look for evidence for this, and more hands, more eyes, a better result. Is, um, you already mentioned the education piece, but kind of looking ahead now, what do you, what is, what do you guys and the board, I mean, what do you see, you know, that classic question, five to ten years, but... Uh, Five to ten years talking about something like this is just seems silly when you're talking about a potentially two hundred year old plus, you know, a piece of property. So what what would you um, looking ahead? What do you see for the for the property, the organization? Um, again, maybe besides what you, some things you've already you already mentioned. 
Okay, I'm going to start out with something that anybody that owns a house knows this for sure, <laughs> that you constantly have to be maintaining it. Yep. And that's no less so with the homestead. And there's some roof work that needs to be done. There's the recreation of the gas house. It did have gas lighting hmm. sometime at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, and turn those into restroom facilities so that we can have classrooms come out there. Okay. And again, um, there's always the need for additional uh, nuanced or nuanced historical work for this. So okay. it's going to be just like your house. You're constantly going to be looking at things that are going to need to be repaired or timbers that need to be replaced and keeping up with uh, specialists that know how to do that stuff. Yeah, yes, my, 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 might not be something you just go down to Home Depot and buy something, right? <laughs> that's, that's a great point. And the other part yeah. of that is is that a lot of the stuff um, that are being are people that are working at Home Depot or Lowe's, uh, they know about what's going on today, but aren't necessarily um, having the skill sets to be able to you know trim a log <laughs> and or do some iron work. We had a um, blacksmith shop that was associated with the house, so someone had to be able to make nails, and you can see handmade nails in the um, the clabbered siding of it, and that's that's a whole story in itself. Oh, I'm sure. That's interesting. Uh, anything you would add to that, Robert? About I, th- I the think future? our I think our most immediate is the construction of the gas house, the gotcha. reconstruction, and we're doing our best to do with it, like we did with the house, is is restore it, and in this case, reconstru- reconstruct it as closely as possible to the historic nature that gotcha. it was to, to begin with. And so we have fortunately received a state grant to, to do that and to put the restroom facility that we desperately have needed <laughs> out there for a long time um, in that facility. And so we had our first contractor out, for some reason, people have been busy over the last year and a half or so, you yeah, know, yeah. and we've been advertising for people to come out and, and give us some prices and look at the job. And so the first one actually came out yesterday, and, and we were I was very encouraged well, good. By, the, by the prospects of, of yeah. so. The contracting world has been interesting the last couple of years. Oh, I'll, I know, just, I I'll know. just, I'll leave it at that. I know, I know. <laughs> Lots of different reasons. But uh, so that that's the first thing, you know, and of course, like, Alan said, said, we've got to keep the house up uh, structurally. Sure. We've got to maintain it. Um, also, the, you have your house structure here, and then behind it is a log structure that was actually a separate building at one point in time. Yeah. And it was, we suggest that it was used as the kitchen. We think that it was. Uh, and between there is a dog trot. So you see, you have all these, and you have three porches. <laughs> and the porches, the the porches are, um, you know, weathered. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, out. And so, so we have issues with that that we have to maintain. The other thing that we recently, five years ago, yeah. seven years ago, it's been. Who told me? 20, I'm an archaeologist. Time doesn't mean anything. That's right. No, that's why. Uh, that's why I said that we're talking about five to ten years on it. Yeah. It's relative to something like this, isn't it? We were very, very fortunate to receive <laughs> a gift of uh, the Eli Hall House, which is across the road, uh, a little closer toward Dallas, but okay. within eyesight. This is a wonderful federal structure, one of the nice, nicest, well-built structures, well-decorated, uh, formed structures that is in Gaston County today, and in fact, even in western North Carolina. It's looked at as, as being one of the best structures. Uh, and so we have that structure as well that we're trying to maintain. We have some specific work up there that we really need to get done. But, again, finding folks to get it done and, and again, to fit our finances around it right. uh, is always a challenge. But uh, those are all the things that we're doing. And I guess you know, it would be nice if we could ever afford a person or persons to actually work for us. <laughs> yeah. This is yeah, an entirely all, yeah. volunteer Correct. operation. Right. We're all volunteers. Sure. So and this is one of my questions I like to ask because this is, you know, ultimately this is a podcast about Gaston County, and this is obviously, uh, to, to me anyway, this is extremely uh, interesting 
to hear, but thinking about your organization, why is Gaston County better because of the work you were doing and because of having that maybe historical gym, with that, for lack of a better word, um, you know, here here in Gaston County? Maybe start with you, Dr. May. Why, why is Gaston County better for it? I, it goes back to something that um, – that we say over at the museum, you um, you appreciate and love what you know. And if you don't know it, then you can't appreciate or understand it <laughs> or put it into a larger context. For us, it's an understanding that the larger context is that, the, as Robert pointed out, there were historical events that were going on uh, at this period that uh, is a touchstone with our own history. And um, we need to uh, continue to promote and understand that history and our increased understanding of the nuanced part of that history as well. Right. Very good. Robert, how would you, would you answer that any differently or how would you uh, say? I would agree with everything Alan. Of course, I always agree with everything Alan says. But <laughs> That's probably a good plan, isn't it? <laughs> it is, it is, <laughs> since he's the chief, you know. Uh, but yeah, I think that I think as 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 a historian, if I if I can call myself that, I think it's a very important for us to understand our past so that we can understand right. who we are right now and what our future might be. And part of that is just an understanding of of the facility itself, how significant it was, how difficult it was to construct, and how difficult it has been now to restore and expensive. To restore and now to maintain, and so, but in saying that, I hope that people who come will learn about how people lived, and how essential it was for their lives as they lived uh, would would benefit who where we are today in our lives and how we've gotten there. And so, while this is a story of an early German. A group who came to America, a German family who came to America and settled in this part of North Carolina. Um, it is also typical of other people who lived here, whether they were Scottish or Irish or English or French. It's also typical the experiences on the whole homestead is also typical of other experiences that other people had living all over the county and all over North Carolina. And all over the United States. So if you if if we can help folks understand how folks lived and what was important to them uh, and what they did in order to survive, even uh, then I think that it'll make their understanding better of our world today, who they are, and where we're going as a country and as a people. I'd like to follow up on something that Robert just said, which which is really really important, and it demonstrates the currency of the need for the educational aspect of the house. We have a lot of discussion going on right now about immigrants and immigration. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're all immigrants, unless we're all Native American, which- Absolutely. Uh, yep. And, and the, um, the idea there is that uh, we need to understand how important immigrants and immigration was, is, and will be. Right. As far as the growth and the development of this country, this United States. I absolutely uh, agree with that. So before we move on to shift gears slightly, is there anything I haven't asked, I should have asked? I mean, before we finish, we will make sure that our listeners know if there's a website, how to get in touch with you guys, uh, donate, get involved. You know, we'll make sure that that's kind of the last thing that we that we cover. But any other questions I haven't asked but should have? Uh, anything else you'd like to share before we shift gears to some of these gas and county related questions? In, in that area, I just written, I, I mainly written down about the gas house. I think we've yeah, covered, yeah, you've that. covered that. I yeah. think we've, yes, uh, sir. All right. So I think we're pretty good. Shape. Okay, you know, I appreciate that. You, oh, we you can do. talk forever. Oh, I'm sure, I'm oh, sure yeah. you could. And, <laughs> and uh, it's an interesting, really interesting topic. But something that we do here at this, uh, at, at our, on our podcast, and this is, you can blame me. We come up with these gas and county related questions, and this is what. Your other board members, your family, um, that this is what they really want to know about you. And this is what's really – former students, uh, they're going to want to hear this. And so we're going to call this the, I don't know, Dallas Stanley Highway speed round of questions this week. Okay, so we're going to start with you, Robert. And you, and being, especially being a Gaston County native, th these really should be down your alley. What's your favorite Tony's ice cream flavor? Chocolate. And I've eaten it since I was about four 
or three. As soon as I could eat ice cream, we went to Tony's. Loved yeah, that's, it. That's, I'm with you. That's my favorite as well. Alan, how about you? Chocolate shake. Chocolate and, shake. And uh, the first time I came to Tony's was the Tony's that was off over by where the farmer's market is. Mm-hmm. That was okay. my first, first one, one too. <laughs> and uh, we would be working up uh, toward High Shoals on an archaeology project, and the crew would – finish up on the weekend and we'd stop in there oh yeah chocolate milkshake gotta have it oh man uh alan sun drop or cheer wine neither um i got hooked on to um sun drop and at a time about 10 or 15 years ago and i decided that it wasn't good for my health <laughs> so i got away from it, well, but, it and yeah I used to be a Sundrop guy big time, but yeah, I've had to give some of that up as well. Robert, what about you? Sundrop in yeah. moderation now. Understood. Uh-huh. How about a favorite local restaurant? Webb. Webb Web is terrific. Yeah, I'd have to say uh, that I would agree with that. Or the uh, Mangiamo's, uh, the Italian place on Main Street. Oh, yeah, the new, newer place, yep. Yep. All right, uh, Alan, favorite outdoor activity besides uh, digging in the dirt? Okay. Here in Gaston County, your favorite park or something you can share with us? Yeah, um, Crowder's Mountain. Yeah. Um, I love to hike the the, the park there. Either uh, and when relatives from out of town come in, we'll we'll spend some time out there on the trail, and uh, it helps me to keep my hand in in terms of identifying uh, plants. Okay, yeah, that are along the trail there. So that's a great place. South Mountain State Park is another. Oh yeah, it's not phenomenal. Very, it's place not too far. Not too to, far at to all. To go visit, but the, those are the first ones that come to mind. Yeah, absolutely, terrific locations, Robert. Walking, hiking, but I live out in the country. <laughs> I live on about fifty acres, a little less than fifty, and so when I walk and hike, I just go into the backyard and just continue walking through the woods. Of, down the stream, oh. you know, all around, and just here, there, and everywhere, and so well, good for you. Uh, and try to try to keep the the flora and fauna as as uh, consistent as okay. it is today. Well, good, well, good for you. All right, here's my personal question that I ask every week, regardless of who the guests are, and uh, even, even if I already know the answer, I'm going to ask anyway. So, Robert, UNC Duke or NC State? Well, I'm going to have to say UNC, but I want you to know that I support every school <laughs> that I have sent money to, uh, which also includes Duke. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, give me something bad there. Some kind of, there we go. <laughs> Dr. May? Yes, sir. Um, in the interest of uh, family uh, <laughs> togetherness, um, I have to say UNC because yeah. Anne's advanced degree is from there. I thought I remembered that from when she was on. Yeah, well, that's unfortunate for, for both because there's actually only one uh, correct answer to that, and this was neither one of those. So um, we're going to move on. Uh, Dr. May, what is something very few people know about you? That um, I have been working on a, a European Iron Age project since 1977. Oh, my goodness. And uh, this, this particular site was written up by um, – Julius Caesar in his uh, Gallic Wars, and uh, there were several areas around there that were important. And when I was in graduate school, I took an Iron Age prehistory course and got a, got an inkling of that. Never thinking that I would be involved with the project then. Now I just go f- for the for the landscape for the for the great uh, um, breads. Gotcha. <laughs> Robert, how would you answer that? Well, mine's not nearly as sophisticated as that (laughs) one, but living living out in the country and communing with nature, I feed the birds, Okay, and I love to do that. But right now, there are more squirrels than birds, and so I'm really upset. Oh, that's too bad. I hear you. What about, uh, Robert, a book or blog or article or something you'd recommend to our our listeners? Uh, I read a lot of history, and I'm currently reading, uh, let's see, Stacey Schiff's uh, biography of Samuel Adams. Oh, okay. which I found to be very fascinating. It's called the Revolutionary Samuel Adams. I think I've seen that title. It yeah. is. It is. It is really interesting, and uh, I've read a lot of. I've read of you know the John Adams, the Thomas Jeffersons, the George Washingtons, and Frank Franklins, and all those folks, and Hamiltons, and all. Uh, but this is a really different type of book because Samuel Adams was a different kind of sure. revolutionary leader. Yeah, I'm a big uh, David McCullough fan, and read mm-hmm. read much of his uh, uh, a lot of his stuff. So. I'll have to, and I'm I'm a big 
Revolutionary uh, War reader myself, so or era reader myself, so I appreciate that. Dr. May, how about you, sir? Yeah, I'll start with, uh, I'll follow Robert on that. I'm, I'm a big fan of Thomas Jefferson, particularly his writings about the farm. And okay. as an archaeologist, I've, I've benefited mightily from his specific discussions about crops and how uh, he was responsible for some of the commodities that uh, he gave or he presented to his African-American slaves. And that was, that was very instructive to me. And then currently, I'm reading a book, How to Think Like an Anthropologist. Okay. That's interesting. So, uh, again, I appreciate you, you kind of indulging us on those Gaston County-related <laughs> questions. Uh, it can, can sometimes get us off uh, topic a little bit, but I appreciate the, the tie-in there with, with, the, with the book. So, got a few more questions before we're going to finish up, and, and maybe Dr. May stay with you. Uh, again, kind of remembering this is a Gaston County-focused uh, a podcast, you know, besides the Hoyle Historic Homestead and the work you guys are doing, why would you say Gaston County is such a great place? I'm glad you asked. I'm not from here. Right. And um, as um, a former um, a judge said one time, I wasn't born here, but I got here as soon as I could. Right. Um, I like that phrase. I like it a lot. What I like about this community, this area, the Piedmont, is that you're between the mountains and the coast, and there's a tremendous diversity in the environment itself. You can go over to Crowder's Mountain, South yeah. Mountains. You can get into the Rolling Hills. You go toward um, Mecklenburg County and Anson County. You're getting into the Sand Hills. Yeah. There's just a tremendous diversity, and that is really what brought me here in the first place, is that I'm originally by training a prehistorian. So it's very interesting to me to identify places on the landscape that were Native American yeah. hunting and communities. And, uh, and seeing this diversity here, it reminds me that this was a, really the goodliest land. <laughs> so I like that, but more importantly, I can be at the beach in three hours and I can be at the mountains in three hours. Yeah, very, very well said. There you go. Very, very well said. Robert, how would you answer that? Uh, I agree with Alan on that. Uh, that it certainly is one of the greatest aspects of our area, but I also would say that my involvement with our public school system is that that is one of the strongest areas in our area that we yeah, have in yeah. Gaston County, that we do a good job, I think, of educating our, our children uh, and I think that the, the, the third thing that I would say was the people of Gaston County. Yeah. Generally, people in Gaston County are just good people. They're sometimes here, here. laid back, sometimes a little not laid back, <laughs> a little too emotional, but they're, they, their hearts are in the right place. Yeah, I'm very passionate about uh, our, our county and our, our area, and I appreciate your comments about I'm a uh, I'm a – a product of Gaston County Public Schools, and my kids are as well. And I didn't turn out too bad, did I, Naomi? Yeah, yeah. Well, my kids would say probably. So, Robert, sticking with you for this last question, um, knowing what you know now, what what advice would you give your twenty year old self? Well, I'm I'm glad I didn't know then what I know now <laughs> for, for a lot of reasons. But uh, I would say for my twenty year old self to relax. <laughs> a little more. When I came out of college, I was motivated to do this and this and this and this, and it had to be all done quickly. Yeah. Secondly, I would say be patient. Sometimes folks would say that I get a little impatient with things, <laughs> and I want things done now, and I want things done right. And then the final thing I would say would be spend time enjoying yourself. All right. With others, with family, with friends, but enjoy and and and. Find the quality of life that we have available to us. Very good. Very good. Well said. Follow that one, Alan. I, I would have to uh, <laughs> uh, totally agree um, and would add the following, that you need to stop and listen to yourself and uh, not get so caught up with what is going on around you yeah. that you discount yourself. And it's very important to acknowledge and reiterate the idea that you are a worthy person mm. and that it doesn't take somebody else's opinion yeah. 
to tell you who you are. And that would be the first thing that I would tell my 20-year-old self. Just relax, as Robert pointed out, and make your own way. And in that way, you will be personally successful, and you will be able to say that after a while, um, you jump out of bed in the morning because you're really excited about the things you're doing. Yeah. And I can honestly say that. Yeah. I and I've heard too. so many other people have said that they always wanted to do what I'm doing, <laughs> and, uh, but they had to go out and make money. Well, the thing about it is that no job is promised anybody. Yeah. You have to create your position. And that's what I would tell my 20-year-old self, too. Take the time to understand what it is that you want to do personally and satisfactorily, and then move on from there. Yeah. That's well, a, those are those are pretty several pretty good nuggets right there. You guys just left with us. Very very, very fortunate to have done and worked in the areas that I've worked over the last few years over my career, right. doing the things that I enjoy doing, and I hope making a difference. Well, very good. So I, again, I appreciate you sharing. That's a question I just like. To, to ask and uh, having some early 20 year olds and then knowing my 20 year old self was um yeah perfect yeah oh yeah so again remember the uh, the the main point here is to bring awareness to the the homestead the organization so where can our listeners go to learn more um get involved donate just anything that that might be might be helpful and, and worth sharing for our listeners there a quick response there would be the Hoyle Historic Homestead dot org website. Okay, and um, reach any of us that are on the board. There's the membership list on that, and we happily uh, accept uh, volunteer help as well as potential members for the board. And you don't have to be an expert in any gotcha. particular thing. Okay, it, it's really nice to have. An interest in history, it's nice to have uh, an interest in archaeology, but it's better to have an enthusiastic heart. Very good. Yes, we need all kinds of help. Any, any last final words of wisdom or anything before we, uh, we close this episode out? The other thing I would say is that if you're interested in learning more about us, like Alan said earlier, attend the open house. Okay. Second Saturday in September, and you will really find out what we're all about. Okay. You'll find that, uh, but good. you'll also find that if you join the board, we're a working board. <laughs> so, so you know, Absolutely. roll up your sleeves and get ready to go. Okay, very good. Well said. All right, very good. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate it. Before I kind of, I close out each episode with my own maybe quote or podcast or, or book recommendation myself, but uh, I kind of want to, first, I, before I do that, I want to acknowledge both of you because you, you gentlemen are uh, both very well respected here in our community. We're very fortunate to have you on this episode, and I'm grateful you know, for what you guys do in the community. I mean, you, you know, without uh, our community is better off because of not just this, not just about what we're talking about today, but, uh, you know, your, your specific service uh, over, over the years and things you guys have been involved with. So I, I greatly appreciate it. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we, we're doing this podcast is to talk to, to gentlemen like yourself. And so our listeners can learn more and realize that with all the wackiness, it seems that's going on in the world these days, you know, there's still a lot of good things going on. A lot of good things going on. That's why we started this podcast to bring awareness to so many things. And, you know, just to our listeners, we, you know, we've, we already got a lot of other episode schedules into the first of the year. So there's still lots of good things for us to, to talk about. So yeah, I, I greatly appreciate you, know, you gentlemen and the work that you do. And so um, my quote in pod, and I got a podcast I'm recommending this week and I'm trying to tie it in. This is one I listen to almost every week. And I apologize for the name, but it's by a gentleman named Greg Jackson. I think he's, he's a professor somewhere, and I apologize. I don't remember where. I didn't look that up. But his podcast is called History That Doesn't Suck. Um, I know that's a little bit strong, but it is really a good um, – it is, it is a podcast I enjoy uh, uh, very much. So um, if you're interested in that type of thing, and another one I recommended several weeks ago was um, American uh, History Tellers, I think is the name of it, uh, or American Storytellers. Uh, it's another good uh, historical – uh, based podcast I listen to. And uh, my quote for this week is one that I actually, this might be one I've repeated. The, the, the first one I've repeated, I think I used this one early on, but I, I just, it's one from Robert Lewis, Lewis Stevenson that I like very much is, don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. And I think that's a pretty famous quote probably, but one that I, I, I believe in. And I sure didn't believe that when I was 20. 
all I was worried about was whatever harvest I was reaping, <laughs> not not so much about um, the, the the seeds that I was the seeds that I was planting. So, to our listeners out there, thanks so much for taking time to listen to today's episode. Please spread the word, or continue to spread the word if you can about the podcast. And please don't hesitate to contact us here at our email, which is podcast at gastonsgreat.com. We're always looking for suggestions for future podcast topics and guests. You can find the podcast and subscribe at the website, gastonsgreat.com, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And please follow us on our, uh, all our social media platforms. And apparently giving us a good five-star rating helps the podcast get noticed, so we would appreciate that as well. Thanks again to Robert Carpenter and Dr. Alan May for being our guests today. Gaston's Great is produced and brought to you by Naomi Hunt and Amy Anderson from GSM Services and edited here locally by the Sumner Group. I'm your host, Stephen Long. Thanks again for hanging out with us, and please keep coming back to hear more reasons why Gaston's great. (laughs) 